Sega's Factory Panic on Game Gear, released in 1991. Oh, take note, this is an exclusive European import. So the key concept here is as follows. You assume the role of an adolescent kid, who's raised on Detch, is breaking into a factory within a totalitarian communist government, run by an infamous tycoon by the name of I Am Greed, and delivering all kinds of resources and essentials to countless communities of needy, low-to-middle-class villagers. In Japan, this was otherwise released as Ganbare Garbi, inspired by the exploits of former Soviet leader-slash-president Mikhail Gorbachev. Whether or not it's supposed to be some kind of social analysis, or if it's part of Japan's typical quirkiness, is anyone's guess. Anyways, as it turns out, both versions happen to be identical to each other, despite a few graphical alterations. Getting down to the nitty-gritty gameplay aspect, it's a top-view action-puzzle hybrid romp. As you participate in each individual factory outlet setting, your task is to deliver the right resources to a specific line of consumers, whether suffering from starvation, sickness, boredom, or any other common dilemma. Ranging from meals, specifically cake and meat, medicine, or get this, actual Game Gear handhelds. These resources are guided and carried via conveyor belts, whose layouts range from static to adaptable in terms of their contrasting orientations. Floor switches are also utilized in conjunction with said conveyor belts to allow for alternating their paths, oftentimes leading to either the not-good garbage chute, inspired by Willy Wonka, or back around. While making these deliveries, you're constantly distracting each jackass factory worker or guard by shouting at them, which strangely enough resembles spitting. Hell, you can also score a megaphone on the conveyor belt for an enhanced offensive effect, and later on a guitar. Those factory workers are categorized including stick-wielding guards, obnoxious machine-gun-wielding ruskies, or an omnoming psycho lunch lady. And I swear to Christ Almighty, they'll all but guarantee your Industrial Crusade will go to complete shit if you're not on your guard every waking moment. And should they happen to get near you at all, an instant life loss thus ensues. However, if you deliver the correct total of essentials to your customers, you've cleared your current level successfully, thus you get to go through the same fucking routine over and over and over. Obvious as it is, as you advance, which is where the next topic comes in, the structures of each factory wing get more and more elaborate, and require a great deal of critical thinking on your part alone, as well as the use of provided ladders to shift the conveyor belt's pathways. And before I forget, you're timed within each and every stage, and it decreases quickly every time you deliver the wrong item to your needy-ass consumers. So if I were you, I'd keep a straight-laced mindset at every goddamn turn. Other than that, the controls are tight and fluid, albeit jerky and convoluted at certain intervals, and can take some serious time and effort to get accustomed with, for sure, likewise with the less than insipid gameplay aspect. Getting to Factory Panic's challenge? You think you know puzzle games? Wake the hell up! Also, feel free to refer back to what I pointed out regarding the gameplay factors, in terms of enemy confrontations, pivotal strategies, and even that searing, mind-numbing, shit-fucking TIME LIMIT! Because I am not recapping any of them. Oh crap, no! 
Anyways, upon reaching the later factory wings, lots of critical thinking, multitasking, and the duality of focus between both the puzzle-solving aspect and the Endless Assault Season's enemy factory worker encounters, the latter of which pose a threat equal to that of the Toad Menace and Bucky O'Hare, Yamagata from Akira, and even Firebrand the Red Armor from Ghost and Goblins, and even Gargoyle's Quest combined, matter a great goddamn deal as the action gets more and more hectic along the way. You only get three lives, displayed in the status screen upon pausing, of course, alongside how many customers you've got remaining, and a somewhat fair yet appalling finite continue count, which, if used up, you can almost guarantee you'll have either a cattle prod, blowtorch, or a chainsaw on standby to deteriorate the fuck out of your handheld. But then again, that's something I wouldn't even go so far as to enforce. Bottom line, as mentioned before, I'd be watchful every minute if I were you, or your ass sure as hell isn't gonna last any longer. And must I mention that there's no password feature here? Graphically, for an early Game Gear game released the same year as not only Columns, Sonic and Streets of Rage, but also Super Space Invaders, Haley Wars, Shinobi, Revenge of Drancon, aka Wonder Boy, Micronet and Konami's Junction, Fantasy Zone, Dragon Crystal, and even Hurt's Psychic World. I know, that explains a hell of a lot, right? The visuals are striking and brilliant beyond imagination, and don't disappoint one frickin' inkling whatsoever. Each and every character and item sprite is designed and animated in the quirkiest manner that only Sega knows how. Also, take note that your character, whether it's the stereotypical kid you're playing in the European and Brazilian versions, the latter of where it was renamed Crazy Company, or Gorby in the original Japanese version, sports a waiting animation in the style of Sonic. The backgrounds, despite being rather subdued, are also fashioned in a suitable manner, and in no way, form, or shape do they deter the player from maintaining a typical focal point on the game situation at hand. Music and sound-wise, while there's no composer listed, and Christ, it infuriates me how some games and sources pull this shit, I mean, I've never had that happen to me before, but what the hell? It could be the work of Nobuo Uematsu for all I know. NOT! Anyways, the soundtrack consists of classic symphonies from centuries past, starting with Tchaikovsky's 1812 Overture, heard in the title screen, as well as the familiar William Tell Overture, heard during each stage being cleared, and well, that's pretty much the extent of it. And while it's catchy and campy at first, it dramatically fumbles the ball after at least the fifth, if maybe the sixth stage, likewise with the correlating sound effects, about which I also might have to look the other way. Replayability-wise, thanks as a whole to the ingenious hybrid of non-stop action and brain-busting puzzle-solving mechanics that Factory Panic has to offer. You'll be immersed into each and every aspect of it in more ways than one could possibly contrive. But trust me, I've said this shit before, and I'll say it again, but no more. Lots and lots of time, discipline, and adherence are huge pluses and necessities for progression throughout elaborate hidden gems such as this. At this juncture, I find absolutely no need to paraphrase what's already been pointed out. Other than that, it's easy to see why this game also never bothered to see a physical release here in our old US of A, its main reason being that it's too deeply connected to Soviet ties. Anyhow, if you're on the search for an offbeat, idiosyncratic action puzzle hybrid romp on the go, look no further than Factory Panic. At certain online auctions, it should run you between 3 to 15 bucks, and trust me, you will not regret it in the slightest. Until then, this is the Hardcore Retro God signing off.